so far, we've had a couple of examples of how you can compare different paintings and also what to look for in terms of formal composition, what is being shown, and how you want to look for, especially with romantic landscape paintings, you want to look for, for a statement the artist is making. This is what is behind the things. There is something there that you can't see, but that the painting is nonetheless trying to bring out. Now, before I move on to talk about how German Romanticism in particular influenced the main American school of art that painted this way, I wanted to point out a few ironies involved in the appropriation of Romanticism by nationalism. First, Romanticism is an international style. The people who learn how to paint in this fashion travel to Italy or to Germany. There, they collaborate with artists from around the world with the goal in mind of painting scenes that embody the spirit of their particular nation. In other words, they're going to be painting very similar motives, except one painter wants to show the unique spirit of the Romanian nation, the other, the Hungarian one, the German, and so on and so forth. And this, of course, um, happens without any apparent sense of irony on the part of the actor. The second irony is that the Industrial Revolution, which is going on at this time, is changing the very landscapes that are being represented as eternal embodiments of the spirit of the people in this art. And definitely, ironically, the landscape paintings themselves contribute to the intrusion of the Industrial Revolution into that landscape. Consider that railroad lines often relied on tourism for um, their profitability. They certainly made sure to publish guidebooks to let people know what they can see if they take that newly built railroad line to a destination. For instance, the painting you saw by Meyer of Hohenstaufen done in the 1830s was an illustration completed for a tourist guidebook published by the Lake Constance Steamship Company as a way of attracting travelers to Lake Constance so that the company makes a profit. And they recruited to write this guidebook, which was written at a level that it would appeal to a well-educated upper middle class crowd. Um, they recruited both famous painters and also the, the leading exponent of the Swabian School of Poetry, Gustav Schwab Sr., a minister from, a Puritan minister from Swabia, who was known for his Greek to German translations. And he wrote that guidebook. And in the pages of the guidebook, he described precisely the historical events that unfolded. He talked about the Stauffer dynasty and all the other um, moments of greatness that unfolded in that landscape. So a, there's a perfect um, collusion almost between nationalism, commercialism, industry, um, but in the process, of, of boosting, of pushing industry, of becoming um, you know, tools of advertising campaigns almost off the bat, um, romanticism is complicit in the destruction and alteration at the minimum of that natural landscape. And in the process, through the introduction of industrial technology, of making nations less distinct than they've ever been. So just as people are starting to say, Hey, we're different from every other nation. In actual fact, the material daily life is becoming more and more globalized, more and more uniform. In the American case, the school that most embodied um, this international style is called the Hudson River School. It's not a school in the sense that it has, it's not an institution where you can get a degree 
it's a school of artists, like you have a school of fish who travel together and follow the same direction. So one of the people in the Hudson River School is of course, Emanuel Leutzen. George Innes, who painted this work, is another. It is titled the Lackawanna Valley, which is in North, Western New Jersey, I want to say, possibly in Pennsylvania. Um, what you see here, in a way, is like a perfect quote of a Caspar David Friedrich work. The lone tree, except has had to move a little bit to the side, but you have the wanderer with his dog sitting in the grass, contemplating nature, taking in the view. However, front and center is the railroad. and um, the way it is shown, it is a disruptive force. For instance, you have the tree uh, stumps where the forest was cut down to make way. But the curve of the railroad line as it comes down uh, the mountain into the valley signifies a, a selling point that railroads had in the 1850s saying the railroad doesn't really slice through the landscape artificially, it harmoniously follows the contours. It is as if it is just a potentiated force of nature that nonetheless works with the landscape. And then down in the valley, on the valley floor, um, the city of Scranton, I think this must be in Pennsylvania, then it's like in the borderlands there, but yeah, I think it's Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, is shown. That's the headquarters of the Lackawanna Railroad. You see that big round structure, that's the roundhouse, the facility where the engines are stored and maintained. And to the left, you have the town with a church, the town hall, factories. There's one factory tucked away on the right of the painting behind the forest. So industry and the industrial transportation revolution here are in full swing but it's a story of triumph. And just like um, for, da for Kaspar David Friedrich, the smoke rising from the cities in the background signified har harmony between man and nature. So here the attempt too is to say, yes, this is revolutionary, but it is not alien to this landscape. It is a harmonious development. Well, um, the patron, that commissioned this painting, because most paintings are not just painted um, by accident, but there's somebody who says, paint me this. Um, this was commissioned by the very railroad company that is displayed in this painting for advertising purposes. The original went up in the company headquarters and then it reprints to put um, in other places and they used it in their advertising brochures. Um, now, to show you how the influence of Caspar David Friedrich runs through many of these American scenes, consider this beautiful, very small painting. Um, the original of it is barely bigger, depending on what kind of computer you have, but a good size computer screen. Um, it is called Kindred Spirits. And Asher Durand, who painted it, is another famous member of the Hudson River School. This used to be public property, hung in the Smithsonian, where you could see it for free, but they sold it to raise money um, to a private collector, and now it's, it's, you can't see it anymore. What is shown here is um, the recently deceased painter, Thomas Cole, and a poet whose name, uh, eludes me right now, but they all share this spirit of romanticism. They think that what's going on, industrialization and so forth, fine and well, but the real deal is um, to get people out into nature, to commune with nature. Um, and so the friendship between the two men, that they're close, that they have a meeting of the minds, going out into the forests to look at nature and talk natural philosophy that is one and the same and so with the composition of this painting here um, you see some of the things that we saw in Friedrich it is being framed by the birch trees on the left 
and by the cliffs on the right. And you also have the use of these plains. You have the darker foreground, the three trees on the left, and the dark um, rocks on the bottom. And the view is pulled in to the painting through the, the depth created by the valley. Um, it's sort of V-shaped forms, including the bird that is rising from the valley. It becomes lighter towards the top. And it's like you have these stacked planes and it becomes lighter and the colors get more washed out the further back you go. There is also the use of lighting. If you look at this painting, it's almost like a spotlight shines on the two men. And once again, light often symbolizes the spirit, um, often of God. So the two men here have the blessing. And of course, Thomas Cole recently died, uh, dwells with God. So um, that's the message here. Compare that to this painting, which is another Caspar David Friedrich. Here you have three people out on the Baltic Sea Island of Rügen, uh, two men and a woman. The painting is called Chalk Cliffs of Rügen. And chalk is a rock formation that is white. It looks like the chalk you use on the chalkboard. The cliffs of Rügen, this island, are lesser known. You might have heard about the chalk cliffs of Dover at the south coast of England. What you have here is an almost locket-like setup. If you trace the figure of the trees and where the reddish brown foreground meets the white blue background, it's almost like a heart shape. Um, and around the base of that, around the margins, are three people, and it's unusually ironic for Caspar David Friedrich the way that these three are not exactly fearless and triumphant. Consider the man at the bottom who is on his hands and knees and who is peeking over that abyss there, over the edge, into the deep canyon formed by these chocolates. He has put down his hat and cane so as not to drop them down into the, into the abyss. To the left, the lady in the red dress is pointing down but she's also seated safely, uh, clinging to the roots of that one tree. Um, and on the right, the painter has put himself into the picture, and he too is standing and seeking support from the underbrush there. So um, if you compare these two, you do see certain similarities. The motive, friends going into nature to take in the view, the framing, where the trees and their branches, along with the foreground, create um, a kind of centerpiece. So I would argue that this tells, that this shows the, the influence that Friedrich had on, on Durand and his way of seeing nature. Now this is a comparison in terms of bringing out the lighting. Uh, Friedrich has a single light source. <clears throat> Whereas for Durand, you can see you have the sky where there is indirect light and then you have the spotlight on the two figures. Another way, if you're going to compare paintings and look at them from a formal perspective, if you have one of these doodle pads, magnetic doodle pads at hand, it's always fun to, to draw the main lines that make the composition of the painting on one of those. Um, or you can just do that if you can't think of anything to write for your paper to pass the time. Uh, if you don't have one of these magnetic doodle pads, uh, then maybe go and buy one. For the longest time, I was able to convince my children that this was in fact a tablet. Sadly, those days are old. Another Caspar David Friedrich, <clears throat> two men watching the moon. Similar motive, two friends, or possibly a father and son, out in nature, on rocks, trees, indicate this is somewhere in the forest. Here, they're looking at a full eclipse of the moon. This is an event worth seeking out a spot where you get a good view. Um, and presumably, they're sharing their appreciation for the natural environment in the same way as the two friends, um, the painter and the poet in Durand's painting. So um, clearly, Durand has studied his Friedrich, has taken the influence on board. 
And here we return to ask, is this a problem? If Duran's program is to show the essence of the, of the American nation, does it make sense to go to a Catholic reactionary from Germany who is rejecting the entire age of revolution, the Enlightenment, Republican government, all that? <coughs> Does this indicate that people like Durand are having biased remorse? Do they wish themselves back to a time before there was an American Republic? Um, just for instance, if you consider by the 1840s, America was a democracy, at least when it comes to the biggest distinction that there had been, that people without property didn't use to be able to vote, and now they can. Yes, it's still just for white men, but for the men that the property qualification was removed really changes the game, as you saw in the week when we talked about Andrew Jackson. So democracy can't work. It doesn't have a foundation if you don't assume people are equal and that they are rational uh, in making the decisions. So these are ideas that you get out of the enlightenment. Excuse me, out of the enlightenment. So without that, democracy doesn't really have anything to stand on. Add to that that the romantic contemplation of nature in a passive or awe um, filled fashion doesn't seem to gel very well with the conquest of the wilderness that so defines America. Um, and sure enough, it is true that in this Hudson River School, Tom Cole, Asher Durand, George Innes, there was quite a bit of skepticism about democracy. The bias remorse was not so much with the revolution, but it was definitely a rejection of Andrew Jackson and the Democratic Party and the idea that everybody can vote regardless of whether they have property. And the fear that with the Irish coming in and dominating life in the cities, and this speaks to gangs of New York, if you've seen that yet, if not, go see it, um, are somehow altering the nature of the country. And if you seek to commune with the real America, you probably need to leave the cities get away from the Irish, get away from democracy, and get out into nature. So there is that element of a backlash in Romanticism. So the, then the question becomes, if this is true of Durant, of Innes, of Cole, is it also true of Immanuel Leutze, who, after all, belongs to that same general school of thought? Emanuel Leutze, who painted George Washington crossing the Delaware. I argue that Leutze is a, different, um, is a different case. You can't lump him in. Yes, he is also influenced by Caspar David Friedrich, but no, he doesn't buy into the reactionary ideology. So let me show you in two more examples how I think I can make that case. Here you have uh, another wonderful Caspar David Friedrich, Cross in the mountains in the 1820s. If you look closely at the central figure, there's a cross on the top of a rugged mountain, not unlike the one with the wanderer above the sea of fog, and a smaller figure that is just reaching the top of the mountain at the base of the cross in a position that indicates she has just laboriously ascended and is not in a good place. She's kind of, you know, on, on the floor there. There's a figure suspended on the cross. So uh, once again, it helps if you have some biblical background. What you're looking here, uh, looking at here is, of course, the crucifixion of Jesus on the mountain of Golgotha. And the figure who is reaching out to him who comes to visit is in fact the only friendly visitor he receives, Mary, his mother. At this point, we are at the darkest moment in that story of the death and resurrection of Jesus. At this moment depicted here, he is truly dead and nobody admits to having known him and nobody officially mourns him except for his mother. Nobody knows he is going to be 
resurrected and, and going to ascend to heaven. So this is the point where it can't possibly get more depressing. Compare this to this entirely optimistic, even triumphalist painting by Leutze. This painting is not just, it does not just come with the ambition of representing the American nation. It was created with an official um, order from Congress, the Congressional Committee that was tasked with finding, with, with, with commissioning paintings to be put up in the alcoves in the Capitol Rotunda. Remember the Capitol building in Washington, D.C.? There is a big round space in the middle between the two wings underneath that cupola, that dome. And there are three recessed spaces with big walls. And that's where these paintings are supposed to go. And on the strength of Leutze's by then well-known Washington Crossing, the Delaware, Leutze is one of the painters who get the official commission, go paint us a picture that shows how America expands westward. And he finishes this in 1861, and it is still there in the Capitol Rotunda as a mural. So you could see it there if you ever get invited to visit Congress. But this picture shows is, of course, a trek of settlers who are making it across a mountain pass, and they have traveled far enough that they can now see a wide, fertile, plain in the distance and they know eventually soon they will be able to settle there and to take possession of this land. There is a sense of danger certainly. You see that the men on horseback are all carrying rifles. Um, there is the central mountain here with the man who's standing on top of it waving his hat and a second man um, just about to climb up onto that plateau. At the base of that, where the track is winding its way up the pass, you see a cross where potentially somebody probably crashed their Ferrari uh, in a hairpin turn, or, or maybe, okay, tasteless, nice Ferrari. Um, anywho, so these people are settlers. They are the embodiment of the spirit of the American um, nation to go out collectively in a group to take on nature and the native people and to take possession of the land. In fact, the spirit of new beginnings, of um, building something new is also embodied by the other group in the foreground. You see the man who's pointing into the distance um, with the family. He is seated there or he's kneeling and then leaning against him is the mother of the newborn baby whom she's cradling in her arm and an older child in a green hat is sitting to her left. So this is a family, the father, the mother, the baby. Um, if you know your, your um, Christian iconography, this is what we call a pieta, any depiction of a mother with baby. Um, the archetype of that is Mother Mary with the baby Jesus. So you have um, two nods to Caspar David Friedrich's cross in the mountain here. First, you have the cross that you know commemorates somebody who didn't make it on the track at the base of that mountain. And you have Mother Mary and baby Jesus quoted and transposed into this figure of the settler uh, woman and her baby. So these are two, two strong hints that he was thinking of crossing the mountain. Now what I've done here, and I don't know if art historians are allowed to do this, but I'm not an art historian, so what do I care? I've superimposed one picture on the other because I felt reminded by Leutze um, of Friedrich, and if you can figure this out here, that central mountain massive, that plateau, with in one case, one man in the Leutze painting, one man standing there waving his hat in triumph and the other just climbing up, 
exactly mirrors the Jesus on the cross and Mother Mary just reaching the top of that plateau. And the shape of that mountain formation, that rock formation is virtually identical. So I would say that yes, um, here, Kaspar David Friedrich is getting resampled and remixed. But where in Friedrich's original painting, we have a scene of desperation, devoid of anything human except for the crucified God and his mother. Here in Leutze, the people are taking over. It's a democratic painting. In other words, it doesn't go where romanticism goes. To say we reject democracy, we don't trust the people. Leutz is the exact opposite. Um, for him, the meaning of the landscape comes only from the democratic movement of the people to shape their own destiny. And if you don't buy it from this example, let me give you another one. This is a famous painting um, to Caspar David Friedrich's Sea of Ice. And if you're from California, you haven't seen this kind of thing. And with global warming accelerating, chances are even elsewhere, you won't get to see it for much longer. But here you have the ocean frozen over. You get this kind of stuff, you used to get this kind of stuff, stuff near the poles. But when I was a child um, in Germany, the North Sea uh, also still froze over near the coastline. And um, even though I was three at the time, I remember vividly what this looks like. It is um, talk about sublime, the raw force of nature that you witness if you have an ocean that is piling up, moving around thick layers of ice that have formed on it, the surface is um, definitely an impression that leaves a lasting impact. It sounds like you're, the almost spherical, supernatural sound of the ice bending and moving against each other. And the wind with that sounds like a god is having a really, really bad day. And uh, it's a deadly scene. See that there is a crushed ship. It's a good-sized ship. Um, towards the right center, the people on that ship either are already dead or they're wishing they were. So they're not going anywhere. Why the, why the ice flows here are, are colored red, I don't know. Maybe there is land nearby. Maybe um, some, some sand from the coast settled there. I'm sure that Friedrich on his Baltic Sea would have seen the ocean frozen over. So by the coast, it would look more like that. But this is not the first picture you see of a ship um, having to deal with ice on water. You might recall this one. I don't remember whether Kerry Rebora Barrett explained this so well, but the fact of the matter is when Washington and his troops crossed the Delaware, they were in mortal danger. A single hit from one of these pieces of ice that are flowing on the Delaware River, and these boats would go down. That's why it's so important for the oarsmen to keep the ice away from the boats and to really hope that there isn't so much ice underneath the water level, you know, like the Titanic, that it hits the hull. So they have to keep it well at a distance. So this is super risky. They could have ended up like the people in the Caspar David Friedrich painting, but they didn't. And they tried, and they, they knew full well it could be lethal to them, but they did it nonetheless because together, collectively, they had something to fight for. Now, if you compare this with the Friedrich painting, once again, I think you will see the formal similarity. If you're going to paint something about sh ships on water with ice in it, and you've seen the Caspar David Friedrich painting, this is going to be on your mind. So what you see here is that the center group, which from the sketches we know, Washington and the guy who holds the flag, 
that was the first what Leutze painted. And then he built the rest of the image around it. And the way they pose there, the way they're shaped, mimics exactly the central part of the Friedrich painting. But what, it, what is different, once again, the, the dead passivity, man as at best a contemplator and at worst a victim, but not as an active part shaping nature in Friedrich. Whereas in Leutze, humanity goes out, works together, men and women in the case of the trek to the West and babies in the mix, everybody goes out, they, they, um, they consciously follow a goal, they want to make something better for themselves and they do it. And in putting this thought of democracy uh, into this visual language of romanticism is a powerful reimagination of the style that is uniquely American and doesn't just take the reactionary content, but ditches it. So if we now return to the picture that Leutze painted of Mount Hohenstaufen, let me tell you that in his journal, what he was writing about was not the splendor of dead German emperors who had lived in the 1200s, but he was rather thinking of the burghers, the citizens in the cities in the valley, who had had self-government even in the Middle Ages, self-government which eventually made its way to America and there became the principle on which the United States were founded, the idea that the citizenry can shape their own future and their own destiny. So um, that concludes my interpretation of Leutze's painting by showing you the field of influences and ideas in which he operated. And um, even beyond this being an exercise, uh, to show you how one might approach writing a paper, comparing and describing paintings. Obviously, I don't expect you to, to do as much as I did in this very, very long lecture, um, but just to give you inspiration. Uh, nonetheless, I also wanted to make this case because Leutze often gets a bad rap. He is lumped in with the white supremacist, westward expansionist, um, manifest destiny people and so forth, and I don't think he belongs there. Um, he, is a, he is a good guy. In other words, he's, he's in favor of democracy. He's not a reactionary. Anyway, that's all I've got to say. Thank you for sticking with this long lecture and I hope you enjoy writing your papers and I hope you find good paintings that interest you and that you find um, worth looking at for writing those papers. Goodbye.